Okay, taking a look at chapter 27, this chapter is introducing you to tools that can be used when management is considering making um, investments in large capital projects. Um, in other words, these are large investments for which there will be um, multiple years worth of investment involved. Um, in other words, these are not short-term business decisions where we only care about relevant information. Um, these are decisions that will have an impact for many years to come. Um, so there are um, several different tools that companies can use to evaluate these projects. Um, and we're going to apply some of those tools in these problems. The first one we're going to look at is this 26-4. Um, Beacon Company is considering purchasing new equipment for $350,000. The equipment has a five-year useful life and depreciation would be $70,000. We are assuming that this asset will be depreciated using straight-line depreciation and it will have no salvage value or no residual value. The purchase of this equipment should increase the company's net income by $40,000 each year for five years. They are asking us to analyze this new equipment purchase. First, we'll use the um, annual rate of return, which is sometimes called the accounting rate of return, as well as the cash payback period. So let's first analyze this um, option using the rate of return, um, sometimes called the accounting rate of return. This one will be taking the amount of net income associated with this particular investment option and divide by the average investment cost. So they have already told us that the um, average investment will, well I shouldn't say they haven't given us the average, but we can figure out the average by taking the initial investment cost add in the ending investment cost or value, which here is zero. If we take the beginning value, add in the ending value, and then divide by two, that will give us on average um, the amount of the average investment. Mm -hmm. Then to calculate the annual rate of return, we will divide the net income provided by this asset, which will be $40,000 per year, and divide it by the average investment. The income provided, the net income provided by this asset divided by the average investment gives this an annual rate of return of 22.9%. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that really tells us the annual return that we will get off of this investment amount. Um, so Normally what we would do is compare that to some required return that is established by the company. By required return, I mean management may indicate that they do not want to invest in any investments or capital projects that do not provide a return um, below um, or above us. They want a, an investment that will provide a return above a certain amount. So let's say this company's required rate of return was 20%. Then we would see this 22.9% as an acceptable return. Thus, this would be an acceptable investment option. Um, however, if the company's required rate of return was 25%, then this investment option does not provide the company's required return. Thus, we probably would want to not invest in that um, equipment. So that's one way to analyze an investment option. Another way to do it is to figure out the payback period. This um, formula is taking the initial investment amount and dividing by the net annual cash flows. Okay, this formula works when the cash flows are the same every year. To calculate the cash flows on this investment, they told us that the net income is $40,000 per year, but we know in accounting net income is calculated by subtracting not only cash expenses, but non-cash expenses as well. 
a non-cash expenses for this particular asset would be depreciation. Remember depreciation is a non-cash expense. So in order to use the cash payback formula, we do not want annual net income from this asset. We want annual cash flows from this asset. Thus, we need to convert that net income back to a cash flow number. To convert net income to a cash flow number, we need to add back any non-cash expenses. Depreciation is $70,000 per year. That non-cash expense needs to be added back to net income to get to the annual cash flows. Thus, this asset is providing annual cash flows of $110,000. Now that we have the annual cash flows, which are the same every year, how do I know they're the same? Because the problem did not indicate that the cash flows would fluctuate year to year. It told me that the income and depreciation would be the same every year. Thus, the cash flows are the same every year over this asset's life. Thus, now that we know that we can use the formula because cash flows are the same every year, we will divide the initial investment, which is $350,000 by the annual cash flows of 110. When I do that, I calculate 3.2. That means that the asset's payback period will be 3.2 years. In other words, when we reach 3.2 years into the five-year life of this asset, it will have paid itself off. Thus, the initial investment cost is recouped at the 3.2 year mark. That tells me that beyond that point, there's still 1.8 years left in that asset's life that it will be generating cash flows above its initial investment cost. Typically, we want to see a cash payback period as short as possible. As long as it is less than the initial investment cost, it's acceptable, but the shorter the better. Okay, so those are two tools that can be used to analyze an investment option. Um, the negative to those two tools is that they ignore the time value of money. In other words, they ignore the fact that um, an amount received today is not worth the same as in the future. Or looking at from the other perspective, an amount to be received in the future is not worth the same as it is today. Okay, that is due to the time value of money. So taking a look at this particular example, we are going to look at a capital investment tool that takes into account that concept of money changes value over time. Um, so this corporation is considering adding another machine for the manufacture of some cardboard. The machine would cost initially $700,000. It is estimated to last six years, have no salvage value. The company estimates annual cash inflows would increase by $300,000 and annual cash outflows would decrease by $140,000. Management has a required rate of return of 9%. They want us to calculate the net present value on this project and decide whether it should be accepted or not. Okay, the net present value compares the present value of the cash flows associated with the investment and subtracts out its initial investment cost. What we're looking for is something with a positive net present value. If it is positive, it indicates that the present value of future cash flows exceeds the initial investment cost. In order to calculate that, we first need to know the amount of cash flows. This investment is expected to increase 300 and decrease 140,000, which indicates that they expect annually the net amount of cash flows will be 160,000. Mm -hmm. Knowing that each year 
the same amount of cash flows is expected to come in of $160,000. This means we are going to have six years over the life of the asset, six years of cash flows of 160. When we have a series of similar cash flows or similar amounts, we call that an annuity. An annuity is a series of payments. This is the series of payments of the same amount year after year after year. When we are calculating the cash flows of an annuity, and I'm pulling up the um, present value tables of that can be found in your book. It's Appendix G. It's Table 4. Um, what this appendix does, or this table does, you can see down here where it says the present value of an annuity of 1. I didn't mean to go full screen. Bear with me. Hey, okay, What that present value of an annuity of 1 tells me is these factors help us take a series of payments or an annuity that will be received for the years to come and present value them back to what they are worth today. In other words, we have a series of $160,000 that will be received every year for six years or six periods. I am going to go here to the six period row and I am going to go over to the 9% column. Why am I going to 9%? because this company's required rate of return is 9%. Okay. Going over here to the 9% column down to the 6 period row. Do you see that present value factor there? 4.48592. It's where the 9% column and the 6 period row intersect. Okay. If I multiply the annual annuity of 160000 times that present value factor, I calculate what those six cash flows of $160,000 are worth today. Those future cash flows are worth $717,747. Now that I have the present value of those cash flows, I subtract out the initial investment cost. Remember this had an initial investment cost of $700. The present value of the cash flows minus the initial investment cost, there is a net present value of 17747 Since this net present value exceeds zero, this project should be accepted. In other words, overall it has a positive net present value. Okay, continuing on, let's start seeing how these tools can be used to analyze different options. Um, here, this manufacturing company is considering three new projects. Each requires an equipment investment of $22,000. Each of these projects lasts for three years and produces the following cash inflows. So here we have three projects, A, actually AA, BB, and CC. All three of these projects last three years, and here are the annual cash flows from each. Notice that B is the only project that produces the same cash flows every year. These other project cash flows are coming in at different amounts each year. The equipment that is um, being invested, the three different options, it has a salvage value zero. The company uses straight line depreciation. They will not accept any project with a payback period that is over two years, and they require a minimum required rate of return of 12%. What they want us to do for each of these projects is first compute the payback period, and we need to identify the most desirable and the least desirable of the projects using this method. Okay. Remember the payback period. The basic formula for the payback period is to divide the initial investment cost by the annual cash flows. That does not work for AA, 
or CC because they have different cash flows each year. That formula only works for BB, okay, because that is the same cash flows every year. For AA, we have to evaluate each year individually to determine when the payback period is reached. The payback period is the point where the cash flows cover the initial investment cost. Initial investment cost is 22 grand. <clears throat> we need to figure out at what point we reach that payback. So looking at AA, <clears throat> In year one, this thing will provide cash flows of 7,000. At the end of year one, the cumulative amount of cash flows is 7,000. At that point, we have not reached payback because we need at least 22,000 to pay back the initial investment. In year two, 9,000 in cash flows are brought in. By the end of year two, 7,000 plus 9,000 cash flows in year two brings cumulative cash flows to 16,000. We still have not reached payback. Payback is at the 22,000 point. That means in year three, we will reach the payback point because at the end of year two, we are still 6,000 short of reaching payback. We need $6,000 more to get to the payback point. During year three, $15,000 will be brought in in cash flows. We need to figure out of the cash flow still needed, how, what portion of that year will need to progress before we reach payback. We need $6,000 out of $15,000 in cash flows that year. We will reach payback point four years into year three. Thus, our payback point is two years plus another point four of a year. Cash payback is 2.4 years. For project BB, we can simply use our formula because cash flows are the same. Thus, we will take the annual cash flows and divide, I'm sorry, the initial investment a cost and divide by the annual cash flows. Annual cash flows, remember, are 9,500. If I take the initial investment cost of 22, divide by 9,500, payback point is 2.32 years for BB. For CC, we cannot use the formula because cash flows are different year after year. So I need to do the same method that I did with AA. At the end of year one, we will have accumulated 13,000 in cash flow. We have not paid ourselves off yet. During year two, $10,000 in cash flows will be brought in. Some point during year two, we will have reached the payback point because at some point during that year, we will have reached $22,000 to cover our investment cost. Thus, to figure out what point in year two we reach the payback, we will figure out we still need $9,000 at the end of year one to reach payback. Thus, if we divide the 9,000 needed, divided by the 10,000 cash flows provided in that year, we need to go 0.9 into that year to reach payback. Thus, our payback period is one year plus another 0.9 of the next year. Payback is 1.9 years. Based on the payback for AA of 2.4 years, BB of 2.32 years, and CC payback of 1.9 years. The most ideal is the one with the quickest payback, CC. And then the next most ideal will be Project BB at 2.32 years. And finally, AA is the least desirable because its payback is the longest or 2.4 years. Okay. So based on that, um, CC is the optimal. 
and the only acceptable because it is the only one that doesn't exceed a payback period of two years. Okay. Now again, that method ignores the time value of money, so we need to also evaluate it again using a different tool, and this time we're going to use the net present value. Hey, recall the net present value method um, compares the initial investment cost to the present value of the cash flows. Um, so the first thing we need to do for each of these projects is calculate the present value of the cash flows. Um, so here are our cash flows, and we are going to um, use those amounts um, multiplied by our present value factors from our present value table. Um, so before I pull up the present value table, I'm going to bring these cash flows over to the solution here. Okay, so here are the cash flows for AA, the cash flows for BB, and the cash flows for CC. Now let me pull up the present value tables. Uh, recall that our uh, rate of return is 12% and it is a three-year project or a three-year option. Um, okay, so using our present value factors, we want to go to um, table three in the appendix, which is present valuing um, one amount to be received one time in the future. Going to the 12% column, period one row because it will be the first period when these cash flows are received. We pick up the factor of 0.89286. We do the same thing for period two for the present value of the cash flows received in period two. And period three cash flows of 0.71178. Okay. Um, what we will do is multiply each of these present value factors by the cash flows to be received in that period to present value those future cash flows. Do the same thing for the cash flows of B to get, oops, let me multiply by the right numbers here, to get, multiply by um, the cash flows for project B to get the present value of those future cash flows and then multiply our present value factors by the cash flows for project C. Once we add up the present value of the future cash flows for each of these projects, we told, get the total present value of all future cash flows associated with the project. Okay. Now that we have the present value of the cash flows, we subtract out the initial investment cost, which was 22, to get the net present value of the project. Okay. Looking at these three, Project BB has the lowest net present value and Project CC has the higher, highest net present value. Okay. Based on the present value of the cash flows, CC is still the most desirable project. Remember up here in the cash payback, CC was also the most desirable. So the net present value confirmed that. Okay. Um, now based on the required rate of return, all three projects are acceptable because all three has a positive net present value. Um, but again, project BB is the least desirable of the three because its present value is um, the lowest. And when we look at the payback period, that kind of jives with what we came up with in the payback period as well. Okay. Um, now, one thing I wanted to point out, notice um, that they have this little number one notation here. Because these cash flows were the same year after year, we could have present valued um, Project BB with the same cash flows every year by treating it as an annuity. Um, and we can, instead of having to present value each year's cash flow individually, using the present value of one table, 
we could have accomplished the same thing by using table 4 in Appendix G. That is the present value of an annuity, or present valuing a series of payments. Um, and the way we would do that is to, again, go to the 12% column, but we would go down to the three period row, indicating that that cash flow will be received for three periods. I would then multiply the 9,500 to be received for three years by the present value of an annuity, and I would have ended up coming up with the same number that I did when I present valued each um, annual cash flow individually. Okay, so um, you can see that we can accomplish this from two perspectives. Let's take a look at a problem that shows us how we can use the present value of an annuity table um, to accomplish this. This company is considering a long-term investment called ZIP. This investment will require initial investment of 125961. It will have a useful life of four years, have no salvage value. Annual cash inflows would increase by 792. Annual cash outflows would increase by 399. The company's required rate of return is 9%. So they want us to compute the net present value. First of all, to calculate the net present value, we need to know the amount of annual cash flows. This problem is not indicating any varying cash flows every year for four years. So it can tell us, we can infer that the cash flows will be the same year after year. So the first thing we do is calculate the cash flows provided by this investment. The inflows less the outflows, total cash flow of 39.3. That cash flow will be received four times over four years. That is the definition of an annuity, the regular same amount of a cash flow period after period. This is a four period annuity in the amount of 39.3. To present value it, I can do it one of two ways. I can do it like we did in the previous problem, present value each year's cash flow individually, or I, because it is the same cash flow, I can use the present value of an annuity, which is table four. To do that, I need to go to the discount column, which is 9%, and it is a four period cash flow. I go to the 9% column, four period row, present value factor of an annuity is 3.23972. I multiply the annual cash flow by my present value factor to get the present value of the annual cash flows. To calculate the net present value, I subtract the initial investment cost of 125,961 from the present value of the cash flows, and I end up with a positive net present value of 1,360. Should this project be accepted? Yes, because it is a positive cash flow. Based on the net present value, um, that looked like a good investment option. Let's continue with that same example. Okay, same information here. Um, still have um, this project ZIP, but ZIP will require an initial investment of 133,152. For your life, no salvage value. Cash inflows would increase by 84,9. Cash outflows would increase 39,3. The company has a required rate of return of 12%. We are going to calculate the internal rate of return on this project. The internal rate of return is another capital tool that we can use. Okay, what the internal rate of return does is it um, comes up with a discount rate, um, or I should say it first comes up with a present value factor and works backwards to figure out what the discount rate is to determine if that discount rate meets the company's required rate of return. 
Okay, the way it does it is to um, take the annual cash flows. Again, for this project, it's the difference between the inflows and outflows to get the annual cash flows on the project. It divides those initial cash flows into, let me get the formula here, um, the present value factor is going to be the um, investment cost divided by the annual cash flows. So here we have the initial investment cost of 133,152 divide by the annual cash flows to come up with a present value of factor of 2.92. We are going to go to the annuity table because this is a series of the same similar cash payments, which is an annuity, and we are going to go to the four period row because that's the number of periods that this cash flow will be received. And we are going to look for the present value factor closest to that 2.92 present value factor. So looking across the four period row, I can see that somewhere between the 12% and the 15% column, I will find that factor. It's somewhere in between those two. That tells me that the um, factors that correspond with the four period row, 2.92, is somewhere between 12% and 15%. It tells me that the internal rate of return on this project is somewhere between those two. That tells me that the internal rate of return exceeds at least 12%. The company's required rate of return is 12%. As long as that internal rate of return exceeds that required rate of return, it is an acceptable project. Okay? So based on the internal rate of return, this is a good option. Okay, we have now looked at this project from a net present value, an internal rate of return, now we're going to go back and look at this investment option and analyze it using the annual rate of return. And this is one of the first problems we did. We can also, um, we've heard this called the accounting rate of return tool as well. Okay. Um, so here we've got the um, initial investment option of 121,440. It will have a useful life of four years, no salvage value. Annual revenues would increase 79.8, and annual expenses that exclude depreciation would increase 40,300. Wayne uses the straight line method to compute depreciation expense. The company's required rate of return is 12%. Okay. Recall that the, let me go back up here to give you the formula for the, um, accounting rate of return or the annual rate of return which is the net income divided by the average annual investment. Okay. Um, what that means is we need to first come up with the net income on this investment each year. Okay. They gave us the amount of revenues annual expenses, not including depreciation. So we know part of our income, revenues minus expenses, but we do have another expense associated with um, this investment. We'll have to add in additional depreciation expense um, using the straight line method to compute depreciation expense. Going into your memory banks to calculate depreciation straight line. We take the assets cost, 121,440. We would subtract out its salvage value. This has no salvage value, so we didn't need to subtract anything out. And then divide by the life of the asset, four years. Cost minus salvage divided by useful life, 
gives us our annual depreciation under the straight line method. Revenues minus the total expenses gives us the annual net income on this investment. To calculate our annual or accounting rate of return, we would divide our net income annually by the average investment. To get the average investment, we would take the beginning investment value minus the ending investment value. I'm sorry, not minus plus, and then divide by two. 60,720 would be the average investment. Annual net income divided by the average investment, we get an annual rate of return or an accounting rate of return of 15%. Comparing that annual rate of return to the company's required rate of return. The accounting rate of return or annual rate of return exceeds the required rate of return, so this would be an acceptable project to pursue. Okay, all right, hopefully this all helps. Um, what we have looked at are multiple different methods that companies can use to evaluate investment options.